All right, so today's class uh, is actually one of my favorite classes, talking about compression, because uh, I think this is one of the really interesting topics that really show or get to the heart of how if we do something, you know, manage our data a certain way inside of our own database system and not let you know, the operating system or some other thing that we have to treat as a black box do it for us, uh, we can get much better results. Uh, but before we start, I want to jump into and pick up where we missed last class, talking about compression, or sorry, uh, system catalogs. Uh, but a real quick announcement, I just totally blew, skipped my mind on Monday, um, but we're having a tech talk next week uh, on the, here on the fourth floor um, from, from the guys from Oracle that built the in-memory fraction mirror data engine we talked about last time. So the same, everything I talked about on Monday, they're going to come talk to you about on, uh, on Monday next week. So it'll be 4.30 uh, on the 26th, so immediately after this class ends, we can just head over there. Uh, to, the, to the auditorium and go uh, see what the Oracle guys have to say about things. So there's, there's a link that takes you to the, to the website uh, on the data group to show you uh, more information. All right, so this is optional, you don't have to do it, but again, it, it's just reiterate the things we talked about last class. All right, so today we're going to talk about system catalogs, we're talk, and then we'll uh, do a quick demo, and then we'll jump into uh, the, the heart of the, the compression stuff we want to talk about today. And there's basically going to be two sort of classes of compression we're going to talk about, two, two categories. The main one we'll talk about is the OLAP columnar compression, because this is where you get the biggest win for, uh, for in, in in-memory database. And then we'll talk about research we've done here at CMU, where we can actually compress the indexes for, uh, for old to be database systems. All right, uh, for catalogs, um, the, the way to think about the catalog is always that it's the it's the, the database with inside the database, right? It's the thing that's going to maintain the metadata about your data. And pretty much every single database system out there is going to just piggyback off of the existing infra storage infrastructure they already have in their database system and store the catalog as, as its own database. So you can store catalog, catalog information as tables inside your database. So there is sort of a chicken and egg problem here because in order to bootstrap the system, you need a catalog, but you can't have a catalog until you have uh, catalog. So uh, typically, the way this works is there's specialized code inside the system for turning the turning you know turning the system on and then initializing uh, all the catalog infrastructure you need to have. So in the code, way Postgres, the way they do it is they have a special script that reads the header file and converts the uh, a bunch of pound defines into this intermediate uh, op codes that they generate and then they interpret that and allows them to then populate the the schema. Right, again, the, the issue is we, we can't write create table, create our catalog tables because in order to know what table you're creating, it has to know what, what's in the catalog because there's no catalog yet, you can't do that. So in our, in our own code, we basically have hard-coded C++ code for, for generating these catalog files or this catalog uh, database. Um, but I think the way Postgres does it is actually uh, quite interesting and probably what we should eventually wouldn't want to do. Um, internally, what's going to happen is since we're writing our system in C or C++, we don't want to operate directly on uh, tuples, right? Because you don't want to say, you know, in order to get the name of a table, we have to invoke a select statement or invoke a, a SQL query and go into the engine and get that. So typically what happens is that uh, there'll be some object abstract abstraction or struct abstraction around these catalog objects and allow other parts of your program uh, to communicate, uh, to, to access their information very, very efficiently. So, the one thing I want to stress that I think there, this is the right way to make the, the to build your catalogs, and we'll see in the case of MySQL how they don't do this, is that it's really important that the entire database management system be aware of the concept of transactions, concepts of isolations, concepts of concurrency control, uh, and this is going to. And if we if we have this permeate all throughout the system, <laughs> then. We're going to be automatically be able to get all the acid guarantees that we get for regular data. Uh, we'll be able to apply them and get them for all of our catalog changes or schema changes. So what I mean by that, and we'll see this when we go through the examples of making schema changes, like if I add a column and that's being done as in a transaction, then I know that no transaction that came before my change will be able to see that column because it's not going to be viewable or visible to it in, in the catalog because they're just they're tables. That they fall under the same concurrency control protections as regular data tables. And then ensures that when I actually commit that transaction that made that schema change, then every transaction that comes after that will be, uh, will be able to see this. 
And then because, again, we're storing these as data tables, if we have our, our, our logging component, can just write out log entries to say, I made this schema change. So when I come back up, I can reinstall it. So again, the right way to do, build your catalogs is have everything be built inside of the, the, uh, the, the database itself. Um, and MySQL is, is, is probably the lone exception to this. So the way to do a bunch of schema changes uh, depends on actually whether you're using a column store or a row store. So it turns out doing schema changes in a column store is actually really easy because the columns are isolated from each other. Right? They're stored contiguously in memory as, as single segments, and we don't have to make major changes to other columns whenever we, we modify something else. Right? So in order to add a column, if we're a column store, it's easy. We just make a new column segment. Right? And as I said, if we're doing this in, in the context of a transaction, we update our catalogs transactionally, and then that, that column becomes visible when that transaction commits. But if we're doing a, uh, a row store, then what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to scan through, and for every single tuple, copy it out to a new location, and, and then append the column where it needs to be. Right, so basically, you have to copy everything. Same thing with drop a column. Uh, there's sort of two, two parts to do this, but the, the, the easiest way is just to do this, the reverse of this. Just scan, do a sequential scan on the entire table and copy every tuple you have into uh, a, new, a new block that doesn't have the column. In um, the case of Postgres, what they do is they're a little smarter, and they just had a flag to the column inside of the catalog and says this, this column has been deprecated. And then it knows that no transaction should be able to see this if they come later on. If you do a select star query and there's deprecated columns, although physically it's still there, you don't get it back in the result. And then when the garbage collector or the vacuum runs at some later point, then you just clean it up and you can print it out. And then, for, again, for, for, for a column store, it's easy. You just drop the memory and, or free the column, remove it from the catalog, and then drop the memory, right? Change columns are a bit more tricky. A change column could be things like changing the type, uh, changing whether something's null or not null. Um, the easiest one to, thing to change in the column is if you change the name of the column, right? You, then you just update the catalog and don't have to touch the actual data. But depending on what kind of change you're making, you may have to do two passes over every single tuple. So, for example, if I'm if I have a column that is um, that is that allows for nulls, and I want to change it so that it cannot have nulls. I got to do one pass through it to see whether, uh, actually, that's a bad example. Um, changing something from not null, from, from that could be null to not null, you just do one pass through, and then if anybody has, the, has a null, you throw an error and don't make the change. Uh, but then if, if, if nobody else is null, then you can make the change, and you just update the catalog. That's easy. A better example where you have to take two passes would be changing it from uh, a 32-bit integer to a 16-bit integer. So I got to do one pass through and figure out whether I'm going to overflow on any value that I have. And then if I'm not, then I can go back now again and then do the, do the conversion of, of the data. Right? And the reason is because you want to do this first check is if something is like it would overflow and you would have incorrect values, you'd want to throw an error, abort the transaction, and don't actually complete the, the schema change. For indexes, it's a, a little bit tricky as well, um, because as we said before, indexes are this weird thing where it's like a copy of the data, you know, it's a copy of the data itself. And we want to make sure that, that this is all done uh, when, when we add or drop an a index, it's all done in the context of a transaction. So if you want to create an index, then you, you, been, since you, have, to do a, you have one transaction to do a sequential scan through the entire table, and it starts populating the index. Now, the issue is in, of course, you don't want to block everything while you do this, because it could take a long time. So you allow other transactions to keep running, and they make changes to that same table, which may affect what should actually be in the index. So what needs to happen is you need to buffer or keep track of all the changes to the table that were applied after you started creating the index, which you can do easily if it's a transaction, because you know what came after you. And then when the scan completes, and you've populated at least the, the, the initial version of the catalog or the, of, the, of the index, then you actually lock the table very briefly, go back and apply all the changes that you missed since you started, and then once that's done, you commit this transaction. Now the index becomes vi uh, uh, visible to all other transactions, and, can be, and can, you can start using this. Right? Again, there's another advantage of having everything be transactions in our catalog, because if we put the cat index in the catalog, and then it became visible to anybody else um, before we started populate, pop, you know, fully populated it. 
then other threads could get, or other transactions could get false negatives or false positives, which we don't want to happen. For drop and index, it's pretty easily, it's easy to do. We just drop the index from the catalog logically, and then that immediately becomes invisible for any transaction that comes after that. But the nice thing is that any transaction that, that started before we did this drop will still be able to, to update and modify it as needed, but then at the end, once we know no transaction could be touching the index, then we can finally drop it. Question? Is this sort of like the idea of a body check funds? So his question is, is this like an idea, is, is creating index like a fuzzy checkpoint? In what way? In a like recording chains, like while another transaction is reading. So his, I mean, we'll talk about checkpoints next week. So his, um, his question is, is, is this idea of, I'm going to start popping my index and so keep track of all the changes that are still occurring while I'm doing this. And then at the end, I essentially do what's called a sort of stop and copy, where I stop everything, apply all the changes that are missed, and then let them proceed. Fuzzy checkpoints are a little bit different. Fuzzy checkpoints are just um, you, you. Fuzzy checkpoints, you don't have to do that final final block at the end, yeah. right? All right. So again, so I've talked about indexes because indexes are the most complicated things. But this would also apply to uh, views, materialized views, or any other construct you can think of, uh, or, or item you can think of that would be in a catalog, functions, things like that, UDTs. The only thing that would, is, that deviates from this, this what I'm saying here about how all our schema changes should always be transactional, the only thing that, that I, I'm aware of that doesn't actually fit into this paradigm is sequences. So a sequence is basically, if, you, if you're familiar with MySQL, they call them auto increments, keys. Right? It's basically a global counter you can maintain in the database so that if you want to insert, say, a, a new unique primary key for every single tuple, like every tuple gets a new, new number, uh, you would use a sequence for this. So the funny thing about sequences is that these are not maintained with the same protections as regular transactions because they have a different property that we care about that we wouldn't get normally in, in other catalog changes. So for example, if I, uh, if I create an index and then my transaction that, that, that the transaction that creates the index is now scanning the table, and populating the index, if it decides for whatever reason to die halfway through, then I don't want any of that, any of the changes to the catalog get persisted out to, to the log because that index never got created because it was not completed in the transaction. But in the case of sequences, what's going to happen is a transaction is going to come along and it's going um, it's going to update the, uh, the sequence to get a new value. And then it may or may not commit but we want to make sure that that value actually gets persisted because another transaction at the same time may also increment the sequence and we'd want it to, to, to the value to go up. And if that first guy fails, we, we go back. We don't want to go back because we've already given out another sequence to another transaction. So what needs to happen is when we update the sequence, you have to create a log entry and it doesn't have to get flushed right away, but you just need to keep track of the fact that if any transaction reads or writes to that sequence in the catalog, then when it goes to commit, you have to make sure that the commit record for that, for that uh, sequence change gets written out. So, so say I have transaction one and two. Transaction one updates the sequence. Transaction two reads the sequence. Transaction one will abort. Transaction two will commit. And it's, it will persist that sequence change. Because the thing always needs to be moving back forward in time. So we can do a quick demo of this in, uh, in Postgres. If I can switch the screen. Okay, cool. Now, you know what, I'm not gonna, no. I hate typing on the surface. That's a terrible marketing thing for Microsoft on video, but whatever. Um. All right, so I'm gonna create a simple table that is gonna have a, uh, uh, they're going to have a, a serial key. So tmux attach. All right, so drop table xxx. Create table xxx. I'll have an ID field. And the, the serial keyword is a, just a, um, a synonym for saying I, I want a sequence. So Postgres knows that they should automatically create a sequence for this. All right. So I look at my table at first. I have nothing in there. So let me start two transactions. 
So this guy down here. So he's going to begin, and he's going to insert into XXX values default. So default basically here in the context of a serial key basically says, it tells Postgres, go get the next sequence and use that. And so now when I look at my table, I get XXX, I have ID 1, because the sequence up, went up by 1. Now down below, if I start another transaction, insert into XXX, values default, and I do a select. I get value 2, right? And again, they're both in transactions. This guy hasn't committed yet, so this guy can't, this guy can't see the other one. So now in this case here, if I roll back, right, and this guy commits, if I can write commit, no, I'm boarded. Oh, there we go. Awesome. Well, that ruined that demo. Actually, roll back. So but both, both these transactions are boarded. But if now if I ins insert again, I will see that I should get three. Right? Because the sequence got logged, even though the transactions that updated the, the sequence, which is just stored as another row in the, in the, the catalog table, this, there's a PG sequence table, that got incremented and technically should roll back because both transactions are ported, but the system knows to always keep having that march forward in time. And it has to be logged because if I crash and come back, I want to make sure that I don't roll back to zero. Yes? So like the before stands for the sequence number. Default is when I do insert the default keyword basically says go get me the next value. So I in theory I think I can do this. Yeah. And I took that. Now let's see what happens. So let's gamble. So I forced it to use 999 and I overrode the sequence when overrode the sequence. I actually don't know the answer to this. Who says that if I insert the next one and let the sequence increment itself, it'll get 1,000? Or who says it'll get four? <laughs> who says four? Raise your hand. Could it be five? Why would it be five? Because we have like inserted a new. I just inserted the tuple now and I, I put 999 in. It would be four. All right, he says four. Who says 1,000? Everyone says 1,000. All right, here we go. Four. Oh, OK. <laughs> All right, so. All right, so that tells you that it's not going updating, updating the catalog. All right, um, so one more thing I want to show you is. Oh, good question. All right, so let's do that. Her statement is, what about if I insert five? All right, so it's there, and now I come back in default. Who says it'll, who says, who says it'll fail? <laughs> A few, who says it'll work? All right, it's 50-50. Didn't like it. There you go. So, all right. Um, so that tells you that the insert is completely disconnected from the sequence. So I'm extremely interested in sequences right now because uh, there's no good paper to say how to do this in an efficient way. Um, uh, there's uh, the different systems all do different things. Cockroach DB always depends like the host number in it, and that's sort of pseudo pseudo incremented. Um, if someone wants to look into doing this for project number three, I definitely think there's a paper here. I'm, I'm very interested in this. And there's also work we're doing basically just in catalogs in general uh, of how to do this efficiently. So the example I said before was like when you drop when you add a column, right? It has to scan through and update you know, every single single tuple to add that column in. Uh, we think we actually can do this in a lazy fashion, where you don't actually update the, the column right away. You don't add the new column. You just keep track of like, oh, I'm at this old schema version, so that when I have to read something, if, when I read a tuple that's in the old version, I know how to convert it on the fly. And we can do this LLVM. So that I'm extremely interested in with. But we, we come to that later. Um, I want to show one quick example here of, uh, do I not have my SQL running? Uh. So MySQL, um, oh, it's hard to see, isn't it? So this is the way to get, I'll just drop, make it easier, oh, make it smaller. Oh, oh fuck it. Um, so MySQL store, doesn't store its catalog 
entirely in the tables the way Postgres and most systems do. They actually rely on the file structure to tell you what databases it has, right? So just do this real quick. Let me just make it easier to see. Drop. All right, so go back here. Show my database. I have 10 databases, right? Well, it turns out if I just go where the MySQL directory is, um, if I can write my password, Windows to firewall defector, oh, whatever, sorry. All right, if I go the var lib MySQL, um, you'll see that there's a bunch of directories here, and these actually correspond to the, uh, the databases that it thinks it has. So if I just create one like XXX, now when I go back in MySQL, and I, show, I say show databases, XXX, right? <laughs> So this brings up a whole bunch of other, uh, a whole lot of concurrency control problems because now, you, like now, this is something that's outside the, the control of, of the of the database system. It's on the file system, right? Uh, so lo and behold, if I go back over here and I drop my xxx directory, <laughs> right, it's gone. So the main thing I wanted to say about this is like that the the putting everything in the in the in the in the in the, in the, the database is the right way to do catalogs. Uh, does it store the tables as well? Uh, like His question is: Does it store the tables as well as in like so in these directories? Like I'm, I'm not a MySQL expert, but um, in these directories, uh, there's like a, these FRM files, right? Oh, you can't. I'm highlighting. You can't see it. These FRM files. I think correspond to the table schema in, in, in MySQL. Yes? I was wondering, if you have a transaction running that's inserting into that database, remove it, and turn it a little bit free. So this question is, if I have a transaction that's running, and wants to insert that, that database, but then I delete it, what happens? Yeah, first of all, that doesn't even recognize that folder, because there's just, that that's just created. There's like no metadata in it. All right, so I think what you're saying, so if I, let's create a real, um, we'll, get a, we'll go through the normal process of creating a real um, database in MySQL, all right? I have to create a table. Foo ID int primary key, right? And now if I go back down here, uh, I forget what I called my table or database, XXX, right? So here's XXX. So here's the files that MySQL created, right? And I see I created my table, FRM, and that's the, that's the schema information. So now your question is, if I start a transaction, insert into foo, values one, two, three, I can be able to read my, 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 my data back, right? And you're saying if, if we're just an unholy monster and just delete it. Uh -huh. All right, done. Still there. What if you Zero is affected. Still there. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> right. Not out. No, no it, you, know, you know why, right? Because it's still in the, the process space of the OS. Or for, it's, in, in, in the, it's in the address space of this, the file is still in, in the, o, the OS still has a handle to it. This process still has a handle to the file. All right, I don't want to, we spent all day on catalogs, as you can see, I find that. So this is the problem I have in this course is like, I was like, man, I, want, I really want to talk about catalogs. I think they're super interesting, but like, there's no paper you can read because we're trying to write it now. And I don't know if I can spend a whole day of just like, hey, let's play around with catalogs, right? So, um, so real quick, yes. Why do we want my sequence and would it be a new bottom access? So his question is, uh, why do we want sequence? Because a lot of applications use it, but it will become will it become a global bottleneck? Absolutely, right? Uh, what, what, what's that? Uh, what will you 
Oh, uh, auto increment keys are used very, very often in database applications everywhere. Everyone uses them. Why not just give them like the same protection as like a dirty read? Uh, give what the the, the like, sequence? Uh, sequences, sorry. That's essentially what they're doing, right? They're like, but but you, but you have to make sure that like it's it's the transaction that updated it, right? Will create the log record for it, but that transaction may abort. Other transactions may read it, and you want to make sure that even though they didn't create the, the change, create the, del the, 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 the log record that modified the sequence, that's got to get flushed to disk before you're allowed to commit because you don't want to come back and say, well, I, the, the sequence is now four, but when I ran before, I got it at five, and I committed, and you told me I committed, but now I rolled back, and now someone else is going to try to insert and get the, get the same sequence as you, and that'd be a problem. So it's like a dirty read, plus some extra stuff. OK. Let's get to compression, because that's, like I said, that's it's all good stuff. It's all database. It's all awesome, right? OK. All right, so, um, so, so now sort of like, again, this is the problem of this course is like, I, I want to talk, talk about catalogs, but then it's a huge jump to say, all right, ignore catalogs. Let's talk about compression. But let's just, just go with it. OK. So back when we had a disk-based system, uh, the, the main bottleneck we always had to deal with in a disk coordinate system was, was disk I.O., right? And in this environment, it was totally fine to take this the huge trade-off of, I'm going to use compression to write my compressed blocks out the disk because, yes, it's going to cost me some, some CPU overhead to decompress and compress them going back and forth, but that pales in comparison of what the penalty I'm paying to read something from disk. So that, in, in a disk-oriented environment, it was, it's an, always a no-brainer to do compression because the, the benefit you get is quite significant. But now the in-memory system, it's a bit more complicated because everything's in DRAM and everything reading, reading data is really fast uh, relative to disk. And so we may not want to pay the, a huge, a, the biggest penalty for computational cost to decompress and compress as we did in a disk system. So we still want to do compression because obviously reducing the amount of the size of the database means that we can store more in the, D, in the amount of DRAM we have, maybe run on, on a smaller machine using less, less energy. Um, but there's actually some benefits later on too when we talk about doing query processing on compressed data because we're now going to be able to do some queries more quickly because it's compressed because we don't have to do you know, a, a large string comparison. Now we can just look at si simple integers. Or in other cases, if it's a bitmap, we can do vectorized execution to pick out things very efficiently. So the key trade-off, as always, in an in-memory database is, is, or any, any, any data system, is always be speed versus compression ratio. And as far as I know, uh, every in-memory database system is always going to choose speed. Right? It's the whole purpose of going to an in-memory system. So in order to understand what we can do with compression, we've got to understand what real data is going to look like. Um, and there's two key facets of them that we can exploit or that we'll be able to take advantage of uh, when we design our compression schemes um, to leverage the fact that this is what the data looks like in the real world. So the first is that the data that, that we're going to see in our applications are, are going to have highly skewed distributions for the values. So what I mean by that is that the, for a single column, a large percentage of the, of, the, of, of the tuples for a given attribute will have the same values, the same subset of values. And so the best example of this is something called uh, the, comes from the Brown Corpus. So this was from Brown University in the 1960s, where they basically selected what they considered to be the, the, the paragons or the best works of American literature of all time. And they just went through and they counted how often each word appears in these different books, right? And it turns out, in the English language, uh, the, the words follow what's called a Ziffian distribution or a parallel distribution. So that means is that the word that occurs the most, the word the, um, you know, it occurs X number of times. And then the second most, uh, most popular word, A, appears half as many times as the first one. And the third one appears half as many times as, as the, sec the second one. Right? So you have this parallel distribution. So in a lot of data sets in, in real world applications, they're going to look a lot like this. Right? You think of like on Reddit, right? There's a small number of, of users actually post most of the articles or write most of the comments. And then there's this long tail where people barely ever chime in or say anything. So if we know this, we can try to exploit that when we design our compression schemes. The second thing is that our data sets are also going to be highly correlated uh, between different attributes of the same tuple. So the best example to think of this is like, like on Amazon, 
the order date, the order, the date that the order was per, was made, uh, is only going to be a few days behind the ship date, right? Usually Amazon ships something in two to three days, right? So these two dates are going to be close to each other. So maybe I don't need to store the entire ship date. Maybe I can just say, you know, here's a, here's the the offset from the original date. Another example would be uh, in in for like uh, uh, mailing addresses. Uh, if you have the city, then then you always know what the zip code is. So maybe I can be smart about how I store these things. So now when we design our compression scheme for our database, uh, there are three goals we, we want to try to achieve. The first is that we always make sure that when we compress our data, so we have uncompressed data, it goes into our, our algorithm or whatever our, our compression scheme is, it's going to spit out a compressed form of that data. We want to make sure that compressed form is always a fixed length. And we know this because the last class we talked about how we want to always want to have these fixed length data blocks and it allows us to be very efficient to jump to a particular offset and say, here's the tuple that I, that I need. The second goal is that we want to have, uh, as, uh, when we, we want to have the database system, its execution engine, as, as it's processing queries, delay the, the need to decompress the data for as long as possible. Ideally, it'd be nice if we can operate our query directly on compressed data all the way up through the query plan, and only when we have to return the result back to the user, the application, then we actually go ahead and decompress this. And you'll see in the case of the, na the naive scheme that we'll talk about, you can't do this at all because you can't, because the, the compression scheme is a black box, you don't know what's inside of it. But for the, 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 the native compression schemes that we're going to have we can built inside of our own database system, in some cases we can actually do this. And the last goal is that we want to have our system be a, a, what's called a lossless scheme. So this shouldn't be news to anyone here, right? The difference between lossy versus lossless, right? So in a database system, we want, always want to use lossless because people don't like it when you lose their data, right? So if I put some data in and I compress it and then I get that data out, I want to get the same, same result. So I need, I need a lossless scheme. The alternative is use a lossy scheme, right? This would be something like JPEG or MP4 where you can exploit the fact of how humans interpret you know, visual data or audio data to throw away some frequencies and things like that that, that we as humans are not going to be able to, to perceive. And so the original data goes in, you compress it, and then when it comes out now, it's going to be a, when you decompress it, it's not going to be the exact copy of what you put in before. And so for video, that's fine. For like numerical data, like your bank data, that's bad. People don't want to do that. So this is why we're always going to be lossless. Now, you can do lossy compression in a database system. But this always has to be driven by the application developer. So, so an example would be, say I'm collecting sensor data right, uh, for, for the temperature in this room, and I'm, collecting the, 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 I'm taking a reading every second. So every single second, I have a new entry or new row in my table for what the temperature was. So now a year from now, I may not care at, at a one second granularity what was the exact temperature at 3.36 PM. Maybe I want to put into buckets of 10 seconds, right? just take the average of them. So that's technically, a, that's a lossy scheme because I'm storing less data because I'm taking what was 10 ticks, now putting to one tick, and I can't go reverse it and put it back what the original data was, right? So this, this always has to be done by the application because the database system can't know what's an acceptable amount of, of data loss, right? You as the human have to decide this. The question, yes? Can we use like, lossy conversion? Your question is, can you use a lossy scheme for the catalog? Uh, no, no, no. You, you were saying like, only for like, application level, can we use in, like, the other levels? And when necessary, we just refer to the base data. All right, so I think what you're saying is you sort of have a cached version of it? No. That, what, yeah. do you, what are you saying? Uh, we basically will, like keep the base data and have a lossy compression and do the log. All right, so, so I think what he's saying is, can you, like, if you have a persistent copy of the entire database, yeah. say on HDFS or something, and you keep that in its uh, original form, and then in memory you keep the uh, lossy version of it. Yeah, and when necessary, oh, sorry. To the base data. Yeah, but when is it necessary? When, like, the operation cannot be performed on top of a lossy yeah, but it's weird because, like, how how can you execute a query when you don't know what data? Like, how can you know what you don't know, right? Like, so I have I have I have my temperature data. I have my time ticks. I'm gonna look at it and say, oh, I have a time tick for for this second, and then ten seconds later, I have another one. 
if you don't know you have you on HDFS you have all that missing data, how do you know what query to ask? Right? And furthermore, you, like so it means you pretty much always have to go out the disk to see whether what's actually there. So nobody does that. This is like, it has to be driven by the app application. What is actually close to what you're suggesting is what is called approximate query processing. And the idea here is you maintain the entire database in a, a, a lossless form, but when you execute your query, you don't end up actually reading all the data. So let's say I have, I want, I want to count the number of visitors to my website from yesterday, and it's a very, very popular website. So I could just scan every single row and, and do a count, or I can get, uh, I can sample and get an approximate answer. So in a lot of cases, people don't care having an exact answer for aggregations, right? I don't, if, if, if I had 999,000 users and I, the data says I have 998,000, do I really care? Probably not. So there are some systems, uh, there's a BlinkDB was a project out of Berkeley, um, and then it was commercialized as Snappy Data, which is Gemfire plus Spark. Um, XDB is a uh, sort of a wrapper layer around Postgres that does approximate query processing. And then Oracle in 2017 added something, um, basic, they have aggregation functions where you can say, I want an approximate count, right? Does it mean that approximate queries can be supported by lossy compression? His, so his, his question is, does this mean, does approximate queries mean you can still use, you can use lossy compression? Yeah. Oh, sorry, lossy or lossless? Lossy. Can we use lossy compression? Like the, so the issue is the, the way these things work is when they give you an approximate answer, they give you a confidence interval. Right, there's, it's not just like you know, roll the dice sampling. There is actually a lot of heavy math behind this to give you, you know, to say here's your answer within some some you know range of, of, of correctness. You wouldn't know what that is in here. Okay, so again, this is another thing where like it's I think it's relevant to discussion, but I, you know, we can't have a whole lecture on zone maps, but you should at least know what they are. Um, zone maps are not a compression scheme. But it's sort of the same idea we'll see later on. It's going to allow us to be able to skip over large segments of data. So it's sort of like approximate query processing, but we're going to get an exact answer. It's allowing us to avoid reading things we know we don't need to read. So the basic idea is that for every single block in our, in our database, uh, we're going to pre-compute all the aggregates that we could possibly execute on the data in this block. So then when we run a query, we go check the, the zone map and say, do I have, you know, can I, is, there any, is it even possible there could be data that I need in here? And if yes, I go actually scan the data. If not, I skip it, right? So in this case here, say I have a single table. It has a single column called value, and then I have five attributes. So I can pre-compute the min, max, average, sum, and count for, for, for everything here. So now if my query comes along, select star from table where value is greater than 600, I can do my lookup in my I do, look at my predicate and say, well, I'm looking for values that are greater than 600. What's the max value for this table? Oh, I see it's 400. So I know there could be nothing in the in this table that could match my predicate. So I, there's no reason for e, for me even to bother scanning it, right? So we actually support this in Peloton. We had a, a student last year that took the class and then did an independent study with me in the in the fall. We actually now support this in in our system. Uh, so the zone maps are just stored in, in the catalog, right? It's just it's another data table. And the way it works is that uh, when we mark a, a, a block of data as immutable, then there could be a thread come along and pre-compute these, these zone maps. And then anytime you, uh, if you, if you need to modify something in, in the block, uh, then this invalidates this because it's all transactional. It happens for free. And then we can recompute it again. So for some queries, this, you can get a huge speed up on these. So this is used, uh, the zone map term usually comes from Oracle. Uh, it's used in a lot of different systems. Vertica does this, MemSQL does this. Um, I think Greenplum as well. All right, so we want to now start talking about uh, what compression is going to look like for us. Um, and the first question we've got to deal with is, what's the granularity of the data we want to compress? So the way to think about this is like, I'm going to have some compression algorithm, and I, I need to compress a, a chunk of data what is the scope of that data that I'm, that I'm compressing? So the easiest way to do this is at the block level. So I take a block of tuples and compress all the data that's inside of it. Uh, I can do this on a, on a tuple level where I go grab an entire tuple, if it's a row store, and just compress the data that's inside of it. I can do this on an attribute level where I just say a single, for a single tuple, a single attribute, let me compress it. 
So this is what Postgres does for their uh, overflow uh, variable length field. So they write it out to this thing called toast, it's a separate storage engine, and then they can do gzip on the, the toast data. So that's doing it on a single attribute. The one we're going to spend most of our time talking about in the class is doing it at the column level, where we take one or more attributes within a single table and compress them all together if, if, if they're stored as a column store. So I'm going to spend a little time talking about the block level, um, and then we'll spend most of the time on the last one here. And the, 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 this one's sort of obvious, right? If you have a Varlin, Varlin uh, pool, you can compress things inside of it. Um, this one comes up in disk-based systems when you do record-level compression, because we'll see how it's better than the block level, because it's going to allow you to jump to a single tuple and decompress it without having to decompress the entire block. So the, the first scheme I want to talk about is called naive compression. And I'm saying naive because the, the database system doesn't know anything about, uh, about the compressed data. Right, so you take any off-the-shelf compression algorithm, whatever your favorite one is, like gzip, bzip, whatever, and you're going to take a block of data in, compress it, and then and write it out and, and store that. So the, as I said in the beginning, in an in-memory system, we care about performance more in, in, over uh, compression ratio. So you actually don't want to use something like gzip or bzip because those are, are really slow. And instead, there's these other class of compression algorithms, uh, like LZO, LZ4, that may not get as good a compression ratio as gzip, but they can compress and decompress much faster. So like I said, LZO was the first one. LZ4 was, was an a improvement over it. And then Google released their, their compression algorithm called Snappy in 2011. And then the current standard that everyone says this is the best is Z standard. Um, from Facebook from 2015. So let's see how now how, how, how this would work uh, in, in a database system. So these naive compression schemes uh, are essentially going to be, actually really any compression scheme is going to fall into two classes. So you can have what's called entropy encoding, where we're going to try to find sequences, of, a common sequences of bits in our data, and we want to encode them using a smaller uh, value for them. Um, and then the ones that are less common, we, we end up having to store them with larger sequences. So if you know Huffman coding, this, this is the same idea here. What's probably more common, and, and most of the techniques we'll talk about, is dictionary encoding. And basically what's going to happen is we're going to find, uh, we're gonna find all the, the different uh, values in our, in our byte sequence, and we're going to extract them, and then map them to a smaller encoding. Right? And then anytime we want to decompress, we go look up in the dictionary and say, for this code, what's, what was the original value? So let's see how to do naive compression in, in MySQL, because I think this really illustrates the difference of what we'll talk about for columnar compression versus what they do. Question? Well, like the difference between the two methods to compress data is like the, they use different bits. Yeah, like the variable or like the fixed. Say it again? Sorry. Like the first one. We'll yeah, this is variable length, and this, this could be fixed. Yes. And what will be the other difference? Uh, I'd, have, I'd have to go look. Um, I don't think I don't think you always need a, a, a dictionary for this one. I think that there's different ways to store it. Okay, uh, so this is what that's how MySQL InnoDB does compression. They added this I think in five seven or five six. Um, so whenever the data is stored out in disk, it's always going to be compressed. And I think they use gzip, I think you, or I think MariaDB can use snappy. Um, but this is always stored, stored on, on disk in a compressed form. And so each disk page has to be one of four sizes, either one, two, four, or eight. And so what will happen is when, you, when it's in memory and you compress it before you write it out, if you take the ceiling of the size of the page that you're, you're compressing, and then you, you figure out what's the next value that I should, or the bucket or, or category of, of this page size I should fall into, and then you have to pad it out so that it fits in this. And they do that because they want to organize fixed length pages out on, out on disk. So then let's say I have a query comes along and it wants to read a, a, a tuple that's in a page. I go out on disk, I fetch it, and I put it into my buffer pool. So the one thing also too I'm putting out here is that if for every single compressed page, they have this thing called the mod log that's, that's a prefix for it. And you can think of this as, as like the delta chain we saw in the BW tree. So whenever I, I have to make changes to data that's uh, it's compressed in this block, I can actually just write the entry of the change to the mod log instead of having to decompress it and then, uh, and then update it. 
right? So this allows you to make changes to things that you know are in this page without having to maybe decompress it. Now, of course, the mob log will get too big at some point, and then you have to decompress it and then merge it all together. So now, say, if, so again, so I want to update on data that's stored here. I can do it on the mob log, and it stays compressed. But if I now need to, to, to read the data inside of it, then I have to uncompress it. And in my SQL, the compressed size is always 16 kilobytes of a page, or uncompressed, the page size is always 16 kilobytes. So the thing to point out here is that I always, they always keep the compressed copy and the uncompressed copy around together in memory. And I think they do this for internal bookkeeping. So they know that like, if I read this and uh, I never actually modified anything, I can blow this away, then keep this, keep this here. Right, because if you blow this away, then if I need to get rid of this thing, uh, I, I have to compress it and put it back out. But if I know I haven't updated anything, I, then I can just drop this, these frames in my buffer pool and then uh, reuse the, the compressed one if I need be. So this just reiterates everything I said here, but the, anytime you need to read something, you always have to uncompress it immediately. You can't do any of this, the sophisticated things we'll see later because you, the, the system doesn't know anything about the compressed data. Like when I run gzip on it, right, gzip is actually going to be doing dictionary encoding and it's going to maintain its own dictionary table that we're going to have to do in our own database system, but that's not exposed to the database server, the database system. So in order to interpret any of the data, it has to decompress it always. So that's going to suck. That's going to be slow, right? And then the other issue is that the the... We're not going to be able to leverage any in our queries. We can't leverage the fact that we know what the query is actually trying to do to maybe use the data in a, uh, or to leverage the compressed data in, in, a, in a sophisticated way or a way that requires us, to, it allows us to do less work. Right? So in the case of uh, some queries where you're doing an exact comparison or maybe like a natural join, uh, we can actually do the, the join or the comparison between the two if the two sides of the, of the predicate are compressed in the same way because it's going to be an, it's still an exact match. So range queries are a bit more tricky. We'll see this later. But what I mean by this is like, say we have a query here, or say we have a table where it's, just, it's Andy and Prashant and we have our salary. And if I use some compression algorithm that then stores you know, with, you know, the, the values in this compressed form, if I take my query that wants to find all the users where name equals Andy, if I run this, this constant here, Andy, through the same compression algorithm and end up with the same, the same value, now I can do my lookup in my table directly using the, the, the compressed form of the predicate. right? Because otherwise, I'd have to go to decompress every single tuple and then do, do the check. So this is one of the this is the key this is a good example of why we want to do compression in our data system ourselves. We don't want to let the operating system, we don't want to let some external servers do it for us. Right? Because we're always going to be able to do a better job. All right, so there's five or sorry, six compression schemes I want to go through. Um, some of these you may have come up in the context of other other uh, other classes you've taken, but I'm going to again these we describe strictly in the in, in for database systems is what we care about here. So we do run the coding, bitmap coding, delta coding, Incremental encoding, most encoding is not truly compression, but we'll see why later. And then we'll finish up with dictionary encoding. All right, so run length encoding, the basic idea is that uh, in a lot of cases in, app, in certain databases, there'll be large runs or, of, of contiguous values that are going to be exactly the same. So it would mean that, say I have, um, say I have, I, I'm collecting my log files for my various services, I'm putting it into uh, my, my table. And uh, I'm amalgamating or combining together different services into the same table. So there'll be some services will have values for some attributes, some services will have values for other attributes. So there may be long uh, uh, runs of con consecutive zeros in, in my application. So to have them store that or in, that in that table, instead of storing that zero over and over again, I instead can just store a triplet that says, there's, uh, at this starting point in, 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 the, in the table, there's a value zero, and it's repeated this number of times. And then when I want to then do my query on them, I know how to say, to interpret that triplet and say, all right, well, if I was at position 10, what would be the actual value here? So we'll see this in a second, but the way to get the biggest bang for the buck for ring length encoding is if you can sort the columns ahead of time in a way that maximizes the length of, of all the runs that are, have the same values. 
So in so this example here, we have a single table. It has two columns, ID and sex. I, and for simplicity reasons, to say sex has either male or female, right? But the same idea applies for other things. All right. So if I want to compress the sex column, right? Say I can store this as 8-bit uh, integers, an 8-bit integer, like 0 or 1. So what I'll do instead of having just repeating male, 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 female, and over, over and over again, I have this triplet now that says uh, I have a value male at offset zero, the starting point here, and then it'll 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 get repeated three times: one, two, three. Then in, in the next triplet, I have fe female, and it's at offset three and repeated one time, and then so forth. All right, so now if I have a query that says uh, I can you know do an aggregation of or, or count the number of males and females. I can just scan through this and find what I need. If I need to say for position six, what, what is, is it a male or female? Then I sort of have to scan through and do the math and figure out uh, wh where I, you know, where I fall in, 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 the, in these triplets. So, and this, this, this is actually a bad, this is a good, sorry, it's a bad example of, of run length encoding because this ends up actually storing more data for the compression scheme than the actual original data, right? Because I have th these, these three values here that have to store that, you know, for a single male or female tuple, I have to store the entire triplet. So if I sort my column ahead of time, so all the males appear, for, appear first, followed by the females, now when I do my run length encoding, it's super, super compact. Because now I only have two triplets. Right? So if you can sort things ahead of time, you can get a huge win for using run length encoding. So think of like if I had a, a table of a, of a billion people, and uh, instead of storing male and female for every single person, if I just sort them on male and female, then for I can represent for two triplets a billion different attributes or different values for for my entire table. Yes. If you're using like row stores, but like reorganizing the attributes by like storing all the attributes. So your 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 statement is if I'm using a row store, yes, then this doesn't work. Yeah. Correct. It's well. It would work, but it would suck, right? Because so you can't like reordering the attributes. So I'm when I when I say sort like so if I go back here like I'm sorting also the ID as well, right? So like th things got things got shuffled, right? So that it still matches. So that like the offset here matches what what the original value was there. Yeah. So ruining like the benefits of. If you if you had a row store, yeah, yeah, this this would it'd be it'd be bad. Yes. All right. So running the encoding is cool because it's going to show up later on because we actually can can piggyback or, com, or can daisy chain different compression schemes with each other. So run length encoding we can actually apply after we do use another encoding scheme a compression scheme and get even more even even better compression ratio. All right. So next is bitmap encoding, and the idea here is that. Uh, Instead of storing all the unique values in our column, we're going to maintain a separate bitmap for every single unique column that I or unique value that I have in, in, my, in my column. And then at in the bitmap, there'll be a one or a zero, depending on whether the original tuple at that offset has a particular value. Right? So the i position in the bitmap corres corresponds to the i pos position uh, in the table. And so you don't actually malloc an entire bitmap to do this. Like if I have a billion tuples, I don't try to malloc a billion bits. Uh, you break them up into chunks and you allocate them to, 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 to smaller segments. So as we'll see in a second, this, this encoding scheme only works if you have a, a small number of unique values in your column. And we'll see why in a second. So let's go back to our example here, the male, female. So what I'm going to do is to encode this, I'm going to have one bitmap for all the males and one bitmap for all the females. And again, for a uh, you know for a particular offset position four, or in this case here, uh, since the original value was female, I'll have a one here and not a zero. Right? It's pretty easy to understand. Um, we'll see later on in the semester that there's variance of bitmap encoding uh, called like the bit slicing, where we actually can do some pretty cool query optimizations on this using uh, vectorization, where now we can uh, exploit the fact that we're dealing with these bit vectors and do certain, uh, certain aggregations very quickly. Like, for example, if I want to now count the number of people that are male, 
uh, I only need to do is look at this bitmap, and I can use primitive uh, 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 vectorized instructions just to count the number of, of ones. And I can do that really efficiently with a, with a few number of instructions. And I don't, don't need to scan and look at every single value by itself. So bitmap encoding, as I said, only really works if your data has, uh, if the, attribute, the, the column that you're trying to compress has low cardinality. To give an example why or when it goes bad, let's say I had this table here, it's the, the customer dimension table, and I want to do a bitmap compression on the zip code table. Um, but the first question is, how many zip codes are there, are there in the United States? Let me take a guess. 100,000. It says 100,000. Close. Well, it's about 43,000. So if I have 10 million tuples and I have 43,000 zip codes, if I just want to store the original data, it'd be, it's 10 million times 32 bits, right, to store this as, as, a, as a regular integer. So I can store 10 million entries, those zip codes, in 40 megabytes. But if I want to do bitmap encoding with this, a bitmap compression, uh, the total size is going to be 53 gigabytes. Because for every single unique zip code, I have to have a giant uh, uh, 10 million entry bitmap. Yes? Well, if you can only have one zip code, why do you need to do, like, in a, in a unary way, write out all these bits? Can't you just do, like, a log cardinality of whatever your space is in terms of Your statement is, uh, yeah, starters, say it again, sorry. So it looks like if I can only have one zip code. You, if you only have one zip code, yes then I don't need to write out all of 40,000 bits. I can just say, for, for a log of that size, each number represents a zip code and a store mapping somewhere else. Yeah, but how, how big is that mapping? Well, it's, it's once the, the size of the entire space, right? You write the space out sequentially, and then you get log thousand code for each. Term. Let's say this offline. I, I, I think you're missing something. Or maybe I'm not understanding what you're saying. It's like an information theory encoding. Like, like succinct encoding? Yeah, like let's, let's, let's take this offline. OK. All right. Uh, so again, so the other issue you have, too, is also maintaining this, because every single time you, you insert a new tuple, uh, now you have to extend all 43,000 bitmaps. Right? And that's bad. So bitmap encoding is, very, is also is very common. but you as the human DBA have to decide when, they're, when, when is the right thing to do this. So this is supported in, in a lot of systems because the, the speed up you can get is, is, uh, is a lot. The next most common compression scheme is called delta encoding. And the idea here is that instead of storing the exact value for every single tuple, we can rely on the fact that there'll be some temporal locality uh, between tuples that, that appear next to each other. And we can exploit that and only have to store the difference between those, the, the consecutive tuples rather than the entire value. So let's say that I have my simple application that's recording the temperature in this room every minute. And so the first thing we see is that in the case of the time, the time only goes up by one minute. Uh, and in the case of the temperature, it's, you know, it's the, the, the values are very close to each other. It's not fluctuating greatly, right? It's not going from zero degrees to 1,000 degrees all of a sudden, right? It's, it's 9.5, 9.4. So what we can do is uh, we'll select the first value, uh, the first tuple, in, in, in this table to be what's called the base value. And then we'll store that in its original form. And then all of the other values that come after it are, are deltas uh, upon the previous. Right, so there's sort of two ways to do this. In the example I'm showing here, it's plus one, plus one, plus one, plus one. So if I want to know what, the, what this original value was, I have to apply all these changes to get down to here. The alternative is actually you could just store it at being the difference from the, from the single value to the base value. Um, so in that case here, I'd, I'd have to store plus four. So the reason why you may, most systems actually store it this way is because we see here we have another example of consecutive runs of the exact same value. But you just keep storing plus one, plus one over again. So actually we can do the delta encoding, end up with this form, and then do run length encoding now, and then just store that we have plus one appear four times. So now we're able to compress it even further. Right, so there's another example where you can, you can, you can piggyback compression schemes off, of, off of one another and get, get better results. All right, so, so a, a variant of delta encoding is called incremental encoding. Um, and this looks a lot like the prefix uh, optimization we saw in B plus tree leaves uh, a, a few classes ago. And the idea here is that when we know that our data has common prefixes, we can just store 
in, in for a single tuple, we can just store what portion of the prefix with the previous tuple that they share. And then they just have your unique suff suffix. So I have my table, I have rob, robbed, robbing, and robot. And so the first thing we're going to see is that uh, we, we start with the, the first value. We always store that in its original form, so there's no change there. But then now we need to go through and figure out what is the prefix for, uh, for each tuple. What prefix did they share with the previous one? So in this case here, rob shares rob with, with the guy that comes before it. So we know that its prefix is just, in theory, rob. Same one for, for robbing. It actually shares four entries because it shares ROBB, and then robot just shares ROB. So now once we compute the common prefix, our compressed data form now says, here's the, uh, here's the suffix that's unique, and then here's the prefix length that this entry shares with the guy that comes before it. So in the case of uh, robbed, it shares the first three characters with the one that came before it, ROB, and then the unique suffix is BED, and that puts me back into the original form. All right, so in this case here, in order to compute exactly what, what's the value for this one last year, you have to apply the changes all the way down. All right, so typically, again, you break these up into blocks, so that way you're not trying to uh, uncompress a billion tuples, right? It's, it's some smaller amount. All right, and the next one is, again, as I said, it's not really a compression scheme. It's more of an encoding scheme, but, but I like it because it's so simple. Uh, and this comes from Amazon Redshift. So they have the ability to, so what you can do is you, you can declare that a column is, is, is a, a mostly integer. And what that means is that it's, say you have a, a column where some of them might be 64-bit integers, but most of them are going to be something smaller. And so you say that I can actually store this data as a smaller data type, and any time I have a value that exceeds the, the, the max size for this data type, I can store this in a separate space. So in this case here, say I have my table, I declare this column as 64-bit integers, and what we see is that most of them can fit into a smaller, a smaller integer size, but I just have this one here that's, that's large. So in the compressed form, I'll have the column, the mostly 8 column, where I'll store the, those values that we had here originally. These will be stored as 8 bits, and then for that one entry that was really large, I'll have a special flag and say, well, at this offset, the data is actually not here. Go look up in some special table uh, based on that offset, and that's how you get the original value. So now as you're scanning along, as you're trying to do whatever, process your query, when you come across this, you know you need to jump here. So this works great if most of your values can, can store it in this, this smaller form. Um, it'd be bad if, you're, if you get this wrong, because for every single entry you look at, you have to go look up in the, in the, in the table to find the original value, and it defeats the entire purpose of, of getting compressed, compression. So, um, like I said, Redshift supports this. I don't know if anybody else does. All right, so in the remaining time, um, I want to talk about dictionary compression, because this was the paper you guys read, and this is probably the most prevalent compression scheme you have or that's available in, in most data systems. Right? If, if, a data system, if a data system says they're doing native compression, um, chances are they're doing dictionary compression. So the key thing we have to deal with this is that uh, we need to make sure that we can do fast encoding and decoding, because we need to be able to get quickly transform our values you know, from the, the decoded form to an encoded form, and then vice versa. And then we also need to make sure that we can support range queries because we want to be able to operate directly on the compressed data without having to go do, uh, you know, decompress everything. So the other two design decisions we're having to deal with is uh, when should we actually construct the, construct the dictionary for our data and what should be the scope of that dictionary. All right, so we'll, we'll talk about those two and then we'll, we'll finish up talking about how we handle this. So. There's essentially two choices when, uh, when you decide when to build your dictionary. So the first, you can just do it all at once. So you basically, you, 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 someone invokes a command, and then you just scan everything, and then you build a dictionary uh, for all the tuples at that given point in time. And then what's going to happen is that if anybody comes along and updates, uh, updates the, the, the table, if they have uh, values that don't fit in the original dictionary, then you need to start storing them in a, a separate dictionary or leave them uncompressed, and then at some later point, rebuild the entire dictionary. Right? This is problematic because, again, you basically have to scan the entire table all at once, build a dictionary, and then at some later point, you do it all over again. Right? It's maybe not so bad if you're using like a vacuum when you're go going through and cleaning things up, uh, 
But in practice for an in-memory database, th this, this is bad. A better approach is to do this incrementally, um, and this will fit with the different granularity of scope, uh, compression scope when we talk about the next slide. The idea here is that uh, we, we try to be intelligent about how we merge in new tuples with the existing dictionary. So I mean, we'll maybe leave some little extra space in order to absorb new values without having to re-encode everything. Um, and at some point, if we, if we run out of space and we can't do this incrementally anymore, we can't, we can't accommodate new values, then we have to do the, the entire recoding again, right? So these two both have, they have plus sides and downsides, they have advantages and disadvantages, but this is the incremental one is what everyone tries to do. So last is now the, 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 the design decision is what's the scope of our dictionary? Uh, and so this is sort of like the granularity stuff we, we talked about before, but it's more like what is the, uh, we can still do compression on a column, but the question is how much of a column should we look at? So the, what's probably the most common way to do this is sort of block level compression. And the idea here is we take a subset of tuples in a single table, we build our dictionary just for that, that block, um, and then there's, if there's another block, it has its own dictionary and its own compression scheme. So you have to do a little, be, be a little careful now to make sure that if you have values that are in the uh, two different blocks, ideally you want them to have the same dictionary in, uh, code, but maintain separate dictionaries for them. So there's a little extra uh, management you have to do to make sure that this happens, because you want to know that if I take tuple with a value A in this block and a tuple with a value A in that block, I want to know in their compressed form whether they're equal. Um, so you can't always do that, but that can be tricky. Uh, the, this is most common, especially in disk-based systems, um, and this is partly for like someone a software engineering or recoverability uh, point of view. So in the case of Oracle, they famously only do compression on a single block because they want every page in the database to be self-contained. So that means that the dictionary itself has to be stored inside the, the, the data page. Because that way, if you trash that page, you only affect that one page. Right? If you had the dictionary stored in another page, and the, the compressed data was, is in this page, if I trash the dictionary page, now that basically corrupts a whole bunch of other stuff. Because right? I, I, I don't know how to de decode it. So they always make sure that every, every, every block, if it's compressed, is always self-contained. The next approach is to use a table level compression. And again, the idea here is that we basically have a single dictionary for the entire table. Um, this is going to allow us to have a really great compression ratio because we don't have to maintain separate dictionaries, um, but it's going to be expensive to update because we may have to re-encode everything. Right? Re-encoding basically says it's in a compressed form now, and I've got to put it back in a compressed form, but the, the mapping from the, the, the dictionary code to the value may have changed, so I have to scan through everything and update, update everything all over again. The last choice is to do this on, across multiple tables. Uh, some systems actually do do something like this, right? This is useful when you want to do things like joins. Right? If I have a foreign key between two tables, if I use a different dictionary encoding scheme for the same column or the sh same shared column on the two different tables, now when I want to do the join, I have to decompress one of them, then recompress them to put it back to the encoding from the, the, the other table or decompress both of them and then do the join, which is the worst case. There's another technique to do multi-attribute encoding. Uh, I'm not, I don't think anybody actually implements this, but it does it just show up in the literature or not. And the basic idea here is that instead of having sort of a one-to-one -one mapping, like a dictionary per column, you actually combine multiple columns together and use a single dictionary. So in this case here, say I have a bunch of uh, uh, same pair of values between value one and value two appears multiple times. So instead of compressing each of these individually, I can now with a single dictionary code have it represent the two columns together. Right? So the example I said before was zip code and city, right? There's always um, there's always a one-to-one -one mapping between a zip code, sorry, a city to a zip code. And so you could have that be stored in this multi-attribute compression scheme like this. Yes. So we're being valid will be invalid when you only access one attribute. His question is, uh, how would this work when you only access one attribute? When the predicate involves. Yeah. Right, so we'll see this in a few more slides, but you actually can do predicates directly on the dictionary itself. So you say, if I say I want to find all the... Um, value 1 equals 2a. Yeah, value 1 equals a. Actually, take, take value 2 equals 101. Okay. 
I can do my lookup in dictionary. I find that here's the, here's the value 101, here's the two codes that match that, and now I know exactly what I, I want to look up. Okay? All right, so the, for encoding and decoding, we want, we want this to be fast, obviously, and it's pretty, pretty basic to understand, right? We have an uncompressed value, we encode it, we get back, we get back a, 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 the dictionary code for it, and then if we give that dictionary code back to the decoding scheme, then we get back to its original form. So the first thing to point out here is that uh, there's no hash function that's going to be available to us to, to do this for us, right? You can't use something like MD5 because that is a one rig uh, uh, hash function. Meaning I put my value in, I get my hash code, I can't go back and reverse it, right? And I don't want to use a compression scheme uh, or say an encryption hash function like SHA-1 or whatever because, what's that? It's costly. it's costly and it's also a variable length. So if I have, say, a, a, an attribute that has four characters or say, say a thousand characters, but I have two different values for those thousand characters, the, the encryption hash function may actually generate, will generate different, different lengths. So that means that we're going to have to maintain a, our own data structure that's going to allow us to be able to map, uh, go both directions, both do encoding and decoding. And so the key property that was in the paper you guys read that we want to, we want to maintain is that we want to make sure that our compression scheme is order preserving. So that means that the values have their own lexical graphical ordering when, in their uncompressed form, and we want their compressed form to also follow that same, that same uh, ordering, same sorting scheme. All right, so if I have a tuple here, Andrea, Prashant, Andy, and, and Dana, the, the dictionary codes that I'm going to generate for these values needs to have the same, the same ordering. Yes? What would that be possible in general? Because it looks like you're fitting uh, more information that down to the, onto the hash key. Like, there are strictly more, more characters than num character strings than numbers I can map to. Alright, so your statement is what, sorry? That the... So, for example, I take Andrea and I just keep uh, attaching A's to it. Yes. Each one of them will, 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 will be, like, more than each other, like, graphically, but I run out of numbers very soon. Okay. I, I'm, I'm missing what you're trying to say, though. So, why is it possible for me to match going to map strings onto numbers and preserving orders when they're all different cardinalities. Why is this possible? Yeah, are we, are we, are we placing some sort of restriction on the, on the keys after the original data? No, there's no restriction. It's just, like, this code, we're generating this. It, it, this is us. We're going to do this. This is not like a hash function. Right? This is in the paper you guys read. They basically maintain a tree and they, they, they generate these codes for every new key that they need to put in, and just, you need to make sure that it fits the same lexicographical ordering. Yeah, but then their code is variable, right? No, why, why would this be variable length? Depending on your 32-bit Th integer, right? So I can now store, like, instead of a var char, which would be some, some arbitrary length, I can now store this as a 32-bit or 64-bit dictionary code. So now it's fixed length. All right, let's keep going. We're short on time. Sorry, uh, we can talk about it afterwards. All right, so as I sort of saying, I said to him before, one of the advantages of this now is that we're going to be able to, to use the dictionary code, the dictionary table we're going to generate, to actually uh, allow us to run queries directly on the um, on on the dictionary to find the things that we want. So in this case here, if I'm doing a lookup where I find all of the uh, entries or the names that start with the prefix a and d. I can actually rewrite this to be a between query because I know that I can, I can do a sort of preliminary scan on the dictionary and say, well, these are in sorted order, so this thing, Dana, the, key, the name Dana does not match uh, my predicate, so I want anything that comes before this, and Andrea is the first key that I have, and that would match, and it comes after that, so I know I only want to look at tuples that are, that are in this range, and I can rewrite that to be a between query. And we can do this because the dictionary is, preserves the same ordering as the original values. Yes? How does Expando like, uh, rebalance your phone to like, give you insert like, 11 bits between Andy and Dana? Right, so we'll get this. So his question is, what happens if I now have, um, uh, if I insert, yeah, so here, if I insert 
20, 100 things in here, what happens? You have to re-encode. Right? So here I'm showing you, have, I'm leaving a little slack space that you could insert maybe 10 or 9 things before you have to re-encode re everything. Right? Or can we use a code in separate files of equal? So his his question is, can I reuse a code? In fact, yeah. that's a bad, that's a lossless, that's a lossy compression scheme, right? So if I reuse Andy and Aaron for code twenty, is this is this Andy or Aaron? Which one? Yeah. So you have to refer the base data. There is no base data. Where the hey, where the database? This is the base data, right? Okay. So look at some other examples, real quick. Uh, so if we want to do, uh, if, we, if we just want to do a lookup on the name, uh, and we do the same predicate before, uh, we still have to perform a sequential scan because we need to know, um, we, need, we, you know we need to get all the unique names that we have, right? If we rewrite this to be a distinct uh, clause, in this case here, we can actually just run it directly on the, the dictionary. And once we find that there's, there's here's, the, here's the unique, values that match our predicate, we can stop there. So, so the main thing I'm trying to find here, for some queries, we can actually just go directly and process, process the predicates directly on, the, on the, the dictionary without ever going back to the original data. All right, I realize we're out of time, but real quickly, I just want to say, you don't want to use a hash table because you would lose the ability to do range of prefix queries. And when we talk about hash table implementations, you are going to store the key inside of the hash table, but you have to look in the buckets to, to get them. And so what you want to instead use is a B plus tree, and that's what they use in the paper. So it's going to be slower than a hash table, but it's still going to allow you to do all the type of queries that we want to do. And so the main takeaway I want you to get from the paper, what makes it interesting is that they essentially had, they, they maintain two trees, and they share the leaves of, of, the, of, 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 they share the same leaf pages across the two trees. Right, so these are going to be sorted sorted leaves. That's going to be the uh, the values mapped to the codes. And so at the top here, you would take the original value and then figure out how to go down. You know, do a lookup in the index, and then find your 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 table here and do binary search to find the thing you want. And in the case of the the bottom one, you take the compressed value in, do the lookup, and this one you have to do a sequential scan because this will be sorted on the uh, the original values. But then you can find your value and return the original form. All right. So this is an example of doing also incremental encoding because I'm leaving 10 slots here to allow me to insert a bunch of stuff. Uh, and then at some point, if, if I exceed that boundary, um, depending on how I organize my pages, I may just need to only re-encode the things that are stored inside here. All right. All right. So we're out of time. I'll stop here. Um, the yeah, the, the the indexing stuff. It just I'll just say that there's there's tricks to do to actually compress B plus trees, but essentially you, you put it into a static form. Um, I can send the link to to the lecture from last semester to talk about this. All right, so um, next class. Oh, oh, you lost it. All right, whatever. Uh, next class. Now we're gonna switch over to logging because now we're gonna start talking about. Uh, again, we're sort of going down the storage architecture. Now we make our changes to the 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 table. We want to make sure those things all always make, out, make it out to disk. And then on uh, Wednesday, we'll talk about taking checkpoints. So sort of the idea is there to take snapshots of the database and write that out to disk as well. Because we still need the disk for recovery. It's just we don't need it to actually where we store the main data. OK? Any questions? Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting Too cold a whole bowl like Smith & Wesson One court and my thoughts hip-hop related Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker Rhymes I create rotate at a way too quick To duplicate, fill a breeze as I skate Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight When I'm in flight, then we ignite Blood starts to boil, I heat up the party for you let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Wreck still turns with third degree burn for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off with St. Ives <laughs>